Well, welcome uh, this evening, and uh, I appreciate you being here. Let me give you just a couple of our procedural kind of things. Uh, in just a moment, I'll invite Dr. Rushton to come, uh, and he'll, make, he'll have, share what he's going to share. Then if you have a question, what I'm going to ask you to do is one at a time, come to the microphone, ask your question. That's so everyone can hear, and also so it can be on our live stream uh, so people can hear the question there. But let him answer it before someone else comes to the microphone. I don't want you standing in line. Just one at a time, we'll do that. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Uh, well, if it doesn't make sense, that's the way we're going to do it anyway. All right? Uh, so uh, it really is good uh, to have you, and particularly I think at this time it's really it's a timely uh, moment for us to have Dr. Rushton. And as you know, he's a an infectious disease specialist, and that uh, gives us uh, just an incredible uh, resource here at the church. And uh, I know that Trent wanted to be here, and my guess is he's tuning in as best he's able uh, there, or will watch this later uh, in Washington. But there are a number of others uh, in our church uh, who are recovering. I can tell you that uh, Carmen got her, re got her release from quarantine uh, and uh, Lee tested negative, and, uh, which is great, and he is out of quarantine tomorrow. So uh, we are looking forward uh, to having him, and he'll be preaching on Sunday. Uh, but there are others, John and Pat, I uh, got a note from them saying that uh, their symptoms have been mild, and they've got a lot of projects done around the house, but they are still quarantined. Uh, there are others in our church family uh, that are battling this, and so let me uh, just, uh, let's take a time and pray uh, for them. So join me, and I will ask you that while we're here, uh, just go ahead and, and you've sit, you're sitting distance, I appreciate that, uh, and if we'll wear our masks, all of that just makes it, uh, makes all of us feel a little bit better about being here. So let's pray together. Our Father, I give you thanks for the opportunity that we have uh, to get good information. Lord, I thank you for the blessing that Dr. Rushton is to our church and to our community, and I thank you for uh, what he will share this evening. Lord, we pray for those in our church and, and those in our community who are battling this terrible virus. Oh, God, for those, uh, uh, we pray for families who have had uh, terrible outcomes, but also, Lord, we lift up those who are in the midst of the battle now. I thank you for uh, the healing that is coming to our staff, uh, to those in our church, uh, to those around us. But, oh God, we know that uh, there are things we can do. Uh, and I thank you for the gift you've given us in, in our medical profession. Lord, we pray for those uh, in the medical field who are standing in harm's way every day, uh, called on to work uh, countless hours in tough situations. Lord, give them strength. We pray for their safety. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the gift that uh, you have given of a vaccine. We pray that it will do its work. Now, Lord, give us a sense of your presence and be with us tonight, we pray. Amen. Well, I'm simply going to invite uh, Dr. Rushton to come. Uh, he'll make his whatever he... The floor is his and ours, and so that's the way we'll do it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Oh, good. I am live. I'm going to take my mask off. I get to breathe some fresh air. That's wonderful. That was a wonderful prayer, too. Uh, but I would also, I don't, uh, it's been a little while since I've actually been able to, to uh, talk in a church and actually, uh, actually get to pray. So if you would indulge me, I would like to open in prayer also. Let's pray. Uh, to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, our paraclete, our helper, uh, we lift up our praises to you to recognize that you are indeed the one true God, a triune God, but the true God. We worship you in spirit and in truth, and we recognize that all that we see and all that we do not see is created by you and for your pleasure. We would pray for understanding, but as Jesus told the Jews who believed, he told them that the truth would set them free. Lord, we are anxious. Uh, we are scared. Uh, 
we are uncertain. And yet, O oh Lord, we know that in you we rest. As the psalmist says in Psalm 91, we are covered by your wings. Even in the times of pestilence, we can rely upon you with whatever comes our way. For some, there will be disease and illness. For others, no symptoms at all. And for others, entry into glory. And we rejoice in all of that. For to live is gain, to die is Christ. We lift these uh, requests and prayers up to you this evening. And I pray that uh, uh, unlike what is typical of me, uh, I will be able to be understood. Uh, give me a spirit not only of humility, but also of understanding. And if that doesn't work, may somebody uh, fling whatever's in their shovel towards me so that I would know. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And, and, and on that last point, I, I really am serious. If I, if I start getting into uh, medical ease, just raise your hand, start waving or something. I was, I was giving a lecture or a series of lectures to forensic science students, and I saw that in a, in a classroom of about 10 students, I had one student who was just, just a face of disgust. And the more I said, the more disgusted he got. And so I had an opportunity at the end. He never really spoke to me uh, at that time, but at the end of the semester, he gave me a, uh, a very clear-cut uh, view of what he thought of me and all the medical terms I was using. And I took the challenge up, and I, I went back over my lectures, and everything that looked like it was a medical word, I wrote it down and uh, actually developed a medical dictionary. So he was <laughs> very humbling, but he was absolutely correct. So, so what I want to do tonight is try to bring us up to speed describing what we do know, all right? There's a lot of talk out there. There is no small amount of, of uh, what might be called conspiracy theory. We might say, wait a minute, you know, we actually think that's, that's what's true. Uh, I don't really want to become political, but public health is political. And all policy that is made in this nation is health policy. So we want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, and even where we think we have a pretty good idea of what's going on, there's still a lot of controversy. And as an infectious disease physician, I have an entirely different perspective than, say, a critical care physician or pulmonologist, maybe even an emergency room physician. And so there is going to be some, some difference of opinion. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, and the beginning is, in the beginning, God created. And we sit, third rock from the sun, between a huge heat energy source, that is the sun, and at the not quite center of our earth, we have this molten iron, which is obviously quite hot. So we have energy from below, we have energy from above. And when God created the world, he created it in such a fashion that it would be regulated. In other words, creatures are born and creatures die. And if we look at some of the smallest creatures, for example, the bacteria, living and death is kind of a confusing issue when you think about a, one bacterium. Uh, my favorite is Clostridium perfringens. It causes gas gangrene. And it makes a new copy of itself every eight minutes. So if you start with one, in eight minutes you have two, in 16 minutes you have four, and if you understand a checkerboard, which has uh, you know, 64 squares, uh, if you, get, you keep doubling, doubling, doubling 64 times, you're looking at billions of bacteria very rapidly, which is why that particular infection kills so quickly. Now, if we go a step backwards from there, we're now looking at these very, very small organisms, if you will, called viruses. And viruses can actually infect bacteria. If you have ever seen a red blood cell under the microscope, you would know that that is 10 microns. All right? That my eyes won't do this, but I am told that if you have healthy eyesight, you can see a microscopic organism at the level of 100 microns, barely. 
and I have no hope of that any longer. But you can understand that a red blood cell is one-tenth that size, and a virus would be, uh, excuse me, a bacterium is a tenth of the size of a red blood cell. And remember, too, red blood cells has volume, so it's, you're going to be able to fit a lot more bacteria in a cell than just 10, okay? If we go back from that bacterium, we're going to have to go several fold smaller. And now we're almost at an atomic level. So now we're not going to talk about meters, we're going to talk about angstroms. And I'm going to leave it at that because I'm already getting dizzy myself. Viruses can, in fact, infect bacteria. And one of my favorite st uh, stories of all time, when I was a student in molecular biology, long before I was in the infectious disease division, was the true story of an American virologist who heard that one of his colleagues in Great Britain had found a new bacteriophage. That's a very technical term for a virus that infects a bacterium. So he wrote a very, and this is long before the internet, there's no email. So he wrote a letter to his colleague and said, dear sir, I understand you have a new bacteriophage. I would like some. His colleague, being the distinguished British scientist that he was, wrote back a very nice letter that basically said, no way. The American virologist said, but I have the letter. So he took the letter. He very gently cut the letter up, put it in nutrient broth, uh, pulled out all the pieces of paper through a filter, and then poured that nutrient broth on a plate of bacteria. And uh, from then, he was able to study this brand new bacteriophage. It had literally been mailed from Great Britain to the United States of America. So we get a sense then of how easy it is for viruses to travel. And we start talking about uh, coronavirus, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, version two, which we have abbreviated to COVID-19. Uh, one can see how it might spread readily, but there's more to that picture, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> the virus works pretty much like a virus in your computer. All right? If you've ever opened up your computer, turned it on, tried to get it to, uh, to start its computing process, and you get an error message. And it says, uh, yeah, this isn't working. Now, sometimes that's just hard drive failure. It's just old. Hard drives fail. Or it could be that in the process of getting on the internet, you downloaded something, and couched within it was a code. And that code found its way to its target if that target is the initializing sequence of how the computer starts running and uh, loads up Windows, for example, that has now been compromised. And until you, get that com you, until you get that code from that computer virus out of the system, you're not gonna have a functional computer. And this is what the hackers do and so on. Likewise, we are surrounded by viruses. There are viruses in the ocean, the rivers, in, um, uh, in the soil, all right? Most of those viruses have nothing whatsoever to do with human beings. They are, their targets are fungi, bacteria, uh, animals, right? And in some of those cases, it's rather pathologic. But here's something that's very, very curious to me. And uh, fundamentally for me, just absolutely amazing. For those of you who love children, who have children, have born children, that can only occur, at least at this point in time, if that uh, fertilized egg now implants into the uterine wall which then sets up the development of a placenta. And the placenta has got to be one of the most amazing organs that will develop apart from the child. 
it's my opinion. Uh, it actually filters. We know, for example, for the hum human immunodeficiency virus, the virus that causes AIDS, it doesn't cross the placenta until there is the beginning of that disruption of the, of the placenta during labor and delivery. And it's at that point that the baby can actually become infected. Uh, we, can, we can see that with, with any number of viruses. And I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that also appears to be true for COVID-19. Placenta actually does seem to filter very, very well, which is, which is good news. But unless you're carrying a child right now, and unless you're a woman who might be carrying a child, you're not going to form a placenta. So where is the placenta in a woman of childbearing age but does not yet have a child in her womb? The code is there. The code is there. It will not be expressed until that cycle begins. Now the question becomes, where, what is this code exactly? And this is where it gets, I think, really just amazing. Uh, it is part of that, that, part of our DNA that is described as the human endo-retroviral component, H-E-R-V. Now, if you're picking up on retroviral, you may be thinking, for those of you who have studied HIV, wait a minute, isn't HIV a retrovirus? And the answer is yes. Specifically, it's a lentivirus. But if we go up one level from there, uh, we get into a broader group of retroviruses. And one group of there, uh, one, uh, excuse me, lentiviruses, and one group in the lentivirus group are called the spumaviruses. They make this foamy kind of picture. Uh, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a cell culture, that spuma virus is actually what has the code to make this organ known as the placenta. Now I don't know when, and I certainly don't know how, but at some point, when Eve started to bear children, she must have acquired this spuma virus. And the message here for me and hopefully for you is to understand that viruses are regulatory. They're either going to downgrade life or they're going to enable and aid life. They're not necessarily evil in that sense. That doesn't mean, though, that they're not difficult. Because we've certainly seen placentas that fail, and we are certainly familiar with viruses that kill. And yet there's a story there as well, which we're beginning to see in real time here. I'm sure you've heard there's a new strain of COVID-19. Started in South Africa, and now it's in Great Britain, and now it's in the United States, and there are 10 states within the United States that have found it. And I heard somebody tell me, well, it's going to be in Ohio within 10 weeks. I'm going, it's probably there now. But you may have also seen that since we have seen this strain of coronavirus, that's what COVID-19 uh, COVID is, that we're not hearing about the people being placed on ventilators. Unfortunately, we have a lot of them infected, and we are seeing still daily excessive amounts of death from my human perspective. And I think there is an incentive for all of us uh, to say, the Lord's will be done, but we will care for those who are ill and those that we can help recover, be cured by God, we're going to do. And we don't know who those are. So we're going to do our best across the board, right? And if we can prevent illness, all the better, all right? And those are the things I think we need to focus upon. But how is it that a year ago in December, December 2019, we were celebrating Christmas, we were celebrating New Year's. If I, my memory serves me correctly, I believe my family was at Walt Disney. 
after Christmas before New Year's. And uh, my mother had died several weeks earlier, so there was kind of a, it was bittersweet, but also something of a blessing for me, because I was with family again. Uh, and then a friend of mine who's a graduate student said, hey, listen, there's something going on in Wuhan, China. And then she said something very prophetically. She, get, she said, you know, the Chinese Lunar New Year is coming up. And this is where things get very, very confusing and very, very unfortunate. But we live in a fallen world. And if you have ever had to go to a friend and say to them, you know, I'm a little concerned about how much you're drinking, how much alcohol you're imbibing. You know, I'm a little concerned about what you're doing with your money. You know, I'm a little, just think through, you know, I think you're, you're, you're talking too much, you're gossiping, uh, I'm concerned that you're missing work and so on. You know how difficult a conversation that's going to be. And you're praying, of course, that that person will be receptive. So when the World Health Organization began to get wind that there was some new respiratory virus that had reared its ugly head, they went in very softly. I would like to use the word obsequious, but that may be something political on my part. So I'll just say they went in softly. And it was in Wuhan, China, as you know. And they told the World Health Organization epidemiologists that the World Health Organization is for the world what the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is the United States of America. And they were told, yes, we have done environmental surveillance. And what we found was that there is this open slash wet meat market. So you would go to this market, and there are animals hanging there, or laying there, depending on whether it's fish and so on, and you just buy it, and then you're going to butcher it yourself. And they said, yes, we have done environmental cultures because these people who are ill with this respiratory virus uh, all said they went to this meat market. So we did cultures. And sure enough, we found this virus at the meat market. So the World Health Organization said, well, okay, great. So we don't think it's really going to be person to person, uh, we're just going to assume that it was a transfer from one of the dead animals there to some people, and that's why they became ill. I will tell you that the country of South Korea heard that and said, no. Uh, we have been through SARS version one, if you will, 2002 to 2004, and uh, we're not buying what the World Health Organization is saying for a minute. We're going to start doing surveillance. And you probably know the rest of the story. Uh, there, was a, there is a German researcher who had developed a very good molecular diagnostic assay. Okay, basically, if we're talking about the code of this virus, for SARS version 1, he had picked out a sequence of code that was unique to that virus. So if that code were present in respiratory secretions, that patient had SARS version 1, 2002 to 2004. The CDC decided not to go that route, even though they had developed a SARS uh, version 2 test, which was really quite good, by the way. They said, you know, hasn't the time come for us to develop an assay that would cover SARS version 1, this new virus, which we now know as COVID-19, and something called MERS, M-E-R-S, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which, interestingly enough, is also a coronavirus and is also found in camels. Now, in my career here in, in, in Huntington, I have never treated a patient either with SARS version 1 or MERS. Probably no MERS because we have no camels here. 
but obviously we have international travel, so it could have happened. Uh, it, MERS is important, but clearly there, there has to be a lot of contact and then travel, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that well in that fashion. All right? We can't say that for, for SARS version 2, obviously. And as it turned out, SARS version 2 was so unique to us, even though we were experiencing December 2019 through the spring of 2020, a good number of cases with regular, if you will, regular run-of-the-mill coronavirus. And there are thousands of these. And they like all different kinds of animals, mostly mammals, what we're interested in, so cats. Uh, a little creature called a pangolin. Uh, my 16-1 nurses, which was one of the first of the COVID units, thought I was saying penguin, but I'm not. I'm talking about a pangolin, sort of a cross between an armadillo and an anteater. And uh, they're being slaughtered. They may actually go extinct. They're a very docile creature. I think they're kind of cute. And then, of course, the most terrifying animal of all when it comes to viruses, the bat. And so what the Chinese researchers basically said was, well, we're looking at this COVID-19, and we're seeing that it's kind of, sort of similar to coronavirus that we found in a specific bat, and also pangolins. Now, the problem is it would take, I believe, by car, but it might be, yeah, probably by, by car. It's going to take 11 plus hours to get to the Chinese, geographically, the Chinese areas that have either the bat in question or the pangolin. But, as it turns out, Wuhan is a large, very large microbiological research city and does a lot of viral research. And there actually is one researcher there who's literally known as the Batwoman because she does coronavirus uh, research. And so there was some immediate thought of maybe a coronavirus got leaked out. If we look at um, meta-human, meta, no, human metanumavirus, it wasn't known if that virus actually caused disease in humans, but obviously if it's got human metanumavirus, it does. And the story there was a young graduate student who was culturing and growing this virus, and I believe it was a, it was a she, and she went home and got sick. They got her back into, into, the, into the lab, swabbed her, and said, hey, guess what? Now we know what this does. It causes an upper respiratory tract. It looks like a cold. <clears throat> so in, the, the, in, in December 2019, spring of 2020, we had a lot of the common cold coronavirus running around. In fact, my very first COVID-19 patient had both regular coronavirus and COVID-19, which did really strike some fear in me because what I had been taught up to then was look for everything else. We don't have testing yet. The CDC's test did not work out well. We don't have testing yet. So if you find another explanation, run with that, it's not COVID-19. Of course, we also thought that we were looking at fever, uh, shortness of breath, cough, that sort of thing. That would be what COVID-19 looked like. And we now recognize, well, that's certainly part of it, but there's a gastrointestinal uh, part of it. There's cardiac issues. There's brain issues. There's also sense of taste and smell. There's rashes. There are feet that get rashed out. And then the children may have a multi-system organ manifestation as well. And so that's going to create a lot of difficulties. But if we go back to Wuhan, the World Health Organization was very happy to say, well, you know what, this isn't really going to be a problem. It's not really person-to-person -person spread. How did that happen? Well, again, they came in in such a fashion. They wanted to help China. They wanted cooperation. And it wouldn't be until some weeks later that the truth about the environmental cultures came out, which basically was 
Yeah, um, we certainly found it on anything like a doorknob that humans infected had touched, but we found it in none of the meat specimens or the counters. So whatever its origin, it has always been human to human spread or human to cat. Interesting enough, but cats have their own coronavirus and if you have own cats, you're supposed to get their felid coronavirus vaccine because it'd be quite dangerous to them. On the other hand, if you own cats and especially the cat goes outdoors, you might actually pick up some uh, elements of coronavirus that will help build up your immunity. So owning a cat is a positive. So for you cat lovers out there, good on you. Uh, we then went into a, a series into a, into, a, into a season of madness. For those of us who follow Jesus, and we know what he told us about the end times, we can predict that these kinds of things are going to happen. The world is in turmoil. I'm not saying to you this is the sign that Jesus is coming again, all right? I'm not saying that. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be scriptural, and it's not something I believe. But I do know that we're going to see all these kinds of things. And for those who are seeking him, to me personally, I think this is a good introduction, so let's discuss uh, what needs to be dealt with and so on. We're apart from God. How do we get back to him? And that's through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in this country, that isn't really the route that I saw being taken the majority of the time. You know, on one hand, we had those who are clearly derived from the Enlightenment, which basically said, listen, I've got a big brain, and, uh, you know, there's a way to solve this problem, and it's going to be through hand-washing, social isolation, and masks. As long as you do all that, you're going to be fine. All right? No. Nothing to be further than the truth. These are helpful tools. I do wash my hands, sanitize my hands. I do try to practice social distancing. Unfortunately, I have to go into rooms with people who have COVID-19, so, you know, take that as well. And then I wear my mask, all right? Try to avoid anything else. I actually also wear goggles, for that matter, because we know that it can, it can get through our, through our eyes. Somebody's coughing on us. Then we had those who basically said, none of this is true. COVID-19 is absolutely harmless. We're taking it all out, of, all out of proportion. And that's when I began to realize that Americans, just like in the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, don't really understand numbers. But who created numbers? God created numbers. All right? So here are the numbers. 80%, 80% of people who come in contact with COVID-19 and get infected with COVID-19 are going to have little to no symptoms. 15%, approximately, are going to be more ill than that. And the last 5% waffle around a little bit, I'm shaking my hands, are going to be those that get really, really sick, and now we have to wonder how sick they're going to be, and obviously about 1% of them are going to die. And what has really disheartened me about this nation from both camps is how cavalier we are. Now, maybe that's just because I lost my mother uh, in 2019, or maybe it's because I'm a physician, or maybe it's because I just think that, that, that the world could be a more loving place. Uh, but I think that's very harsh to me, you know, to say, well, you know, only a few are going to die. You know, if it's you, that's 100%. And if it's your loved one, it's 100%. And I remember, you know, what Stalin said with all the people he murdered. He said, the death of one is a tragedy. The death of 100,000 is a statistic. And every week, Mountain Health will actually promulgate this report about the numbers. I have no idea why they're doing this. If, if we don't understand, even in Huntington, that the numbers are going higher and higher and higher, what disruption has not occurred because of COVID-19? Weddings, worship services, school, 
athletic endeavors, theater. My daughter's a theater student. I love watching her on stage. I think she's the best. A little bias there, right? Uh, and I haven't been able to do that. And she's come home and she's absolutely miserable because she misses her friends. So now we are still dealing with the unknowns. How in the world did this happen? We don't know. We know that the U.S. government did look into the idea this could have been a bioterrorist event. I think that was a very appropriate thing to do. That's what our government should do. They found no evidence. I agree with that. The World Health Organization said, okay, we're going to go back now and hammer China to get a little more information about what was going on in Wuhan. And now China isn't cooperating at all. <clears throat> we certainly have had those in D.C., Washington, D.C., President Trump, who I think could have been a little more diplomatic in that approach. But I'm just saying that in terms of conspiracy theories, I have not closed the book on the possibility that this actually was a lab release. Not intentional, but a lab release all the same. And as a coinciding support, in northern China, there was a vaccine manufacturing plant for brucella. Now, brucella is probably not something that you all are too familiar with unless you raise cattle. Goats, sheep, cows, steers, so on, right? Uh, there's also one that's in poodles, but we'll leave that be. Uh, so they, they've actually developed a vaccine, and it begins as a very live organism, and then they modulate it, attenuate it, and then make it into a vaccine that actually vaccinates without creating illness. They had a release. Thousands became infected and ill with this, and they're still trying to mop this up. You may have heard about the African swine virus or African swine fever virus where pig herds have been destroyed and they're trying to prevent the spread. So, you know, we know these things do happen. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But bottom line is this is a rather contagious virus. And I'm thankful for that the most part it's going to be harmless. But we're still looking at 20% where that's not the case at all. And we recognize that because in the coding of this virus, and if you think about the molecular biological dogma, DNA, right? That's how we have blue eyes, no hair. RNA, the DNA is then translated, or I should say transcribed into RNA, and then from RNA is translated into protein. So DNA, RNA, protein. And the RNA that is being used to now make a protein is known as messenger RNA. It's carrying the message. There are little uh, proteinaceous objects within our cells, ribosomes, that actually are on the lookout for messenger RNA. And it's kind of like, you know, you got your smartphone and you open up the app, that's your DNA, and then you type in what movies are playing were I to go to a movie theater? <laughs> what movies are playing at what times? And so that's your message. And then the app spits out from that message, uh, uh, I don't know, Wonder Woman, whatever, I don't know. Maybe that's it, I don't know, whatever. Star Wars, whatever. And you go, okay, that's the protein. All right? Now, DNA is very, very stable. It's wonderful. It's a hard drive that generally is not corrupted. But RNA, oh my word, it is sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. If I were a uh, monk during the Dark Ages and my job was to copy sacred texts, I'd be RNA. 
Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. If you've seen my handwriting, you know I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've seen, if that's what you want to call it, it's crabbing. We don't know what language it is. Um, and this is actually a great benefit to the virus because if it can change, there's a good chance, a good probability that it's going to change in such a fashion that it takes, it's one step ahead of a very inhospitable environment. So if we think about 80% of humans are going to have no symptoms at all, that's the end of that virus. It's not going anywhere. Although we understand some may be pre-symptomatic and therefore may have a degree of contagiousness. But I am personally right now very, very confused about how much of a risk there really is. And there's reasons for that. Again, one of the basic, one of the main articles I've been looking at that again came from Wuhan, China, when they shut down a city of 10 million people for 10 weeks, they said, yeah, we found evidence of uh, people with the RNA, but they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't infect anybody. They did 10 million, almost 10 million tests. Okay, well, there's some issues there, okay? The CDC says, yeah, 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 no, no, no. We, we still think that maybe one out of four who really have no symptoms or very few symptoms can still infect people, okay? I'm going that route at this point, okay? We're still wearing our masks, washing our hands, socially distancing. But because the virus is kind of sloppy in that fashion, that 80% can be modulated to a degree if that virus changes its main protein that it uses to get into our cells. And you'll remember, or maybe I should say, COVID-19 enters through our nose and our lips, right, and our eyes. It's not foodborne. I'm, I've been very, uh, you know, the Little Caesars pizza box, I read everything. The Little Caesars pizza box actually tells you how hot the pizza is and that it's COVID-19 free, which, by the way, is scientifically true. They're not lying. All right. Uh, and yes, I mean, we have surface contamination and so on. I can tell you that if you go to any hospital that has a COVID-19 patient and you were to sample the air in the hallways, you could find this virus. But unlike measles, which clearly would be infectious, that doesn't seem to be the case. We still have to be in the majority of the time within that six feet mark. And there are exceptions. That's why we say droplet on one side and aerosol on the other. But at least we have that. Um, once it gets into our nose, it's looking for a receptor. Now, if any of you are on captopril, lisinopril, uh, the so-called angiotensin-converting enzyme, uh, anti-hypertensives, uh, anti that's the receptor. That's the receptor this is looking for. And it turns out we have those receptors even in our GI tract. And none of that should really surprise us because if we go back to when we were just a fertilized egg, those cell lines had to start dividing. So we have the, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm, all right? Uh, and so there's a relationship between our GI tract and our lung, and uh, it actually looks like our brains are derived from our gut. Now, you may use that information however you feel fit, especially if you've got Breyer's chocolate ice cream at home. Um, and so we're going to see all these kinds, of, these kinds of symptoms then, right? So we'll see brain symptoms. We'll see heart symptoms. We'll see lung uh, symptoms, GI symptoms. But the lung is really where things get bad. Uh, we know that we can find the RNA of the virus in uh, our colon, and you can actually check sewage. Sewage is a very effective way of determining how much COVID-19 we actually have in a defined area. But it's not the main route. And the reason it, it is not is that as that virus goes through our colon, it gets detergent. Detergentized? Yeah, there's a detergent evidently in our colon, right? And it's no longer contagious. Uh, there is an example out of, out of China. I'm going to leave that be. <clears throat> but in the lungs, if it gets deep in the lungs, then it sets up an immune cascade. 
you know, or immune response cascade. And if it's well controlled, the virus is quelled. If not, we then have all guns firing on our lung tissue. And we get blood clots, and we get leakiness, and we have pneumonia. By the time that's happened, though, it's not so much the virus, but rather our response, our human immune response to it. And people say to me, what about blood types? We hear blood types are important. Yeah, blood types are important because if we look at blood typing across the, the world, it turns out that uh, type O isn't really all that common, say, for example, in Southeast Asia. Type A, type B, type AB. So people said, oh, it's a blood type issue. No, that's an association. It's not causation. So if any of you here have type A, type B, type AB blood, don't worry about that. What you need to worry about is whether or not you have autoantibodies to interferon, specifically alpha and beta, perhaps gamma. Because if interferon lambda is not regulated, we're going to see this robust pathologic response. And then also there is something with the, with the ACE, um, the ACE uh, cascade as well, especially in women who are pregnant. Again, the placenta does seem to protect, but a pregnant woman is already having up and down regulation because she's got not one but two blood supplies, right? She's got hers and then what her baby's getting through the placenta. And so that can be, uh, that can be a real problem when there's a COVID-19 infection because there are, of course, uh, uh, ACE receptors and there's going to be a change in how all that cascade is, is being regulated, okay? All right, last thing I want to say then is where are we going to be six months from now? Nine months, 12 months from now? We are technically not even at the one year mark for West Virginia and Huntington, West Virginia. That's March, April-ish, right? We are just now uh, lunar, the, the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year uh, is going to be, uh, I think, in February. So technically, if you're going by a Lunar New Year, then they're, they're still coming up on the one year as well. There are people who say to me, oh, no, no, I had COVID-19 back in September of 2019. I go, no, you, no, you didn't, okay? Um, yeah, I think, I think some parts of the, of, both, of course, parts of the world, the United States, probably December 2019 would be the earliest. And in many of those cases, we'll never know because it didn't go anywhere. Infected somebody, immune system did what it was supposed to do, end of story, no transmission. But now, of course, we recognize that transmission uh, is quite robust, and the route of transmission is somewhat problematic, right? And I'm being a little sarcastic with the somewhat. Uh, breathing. If you're breathing, you can be transmitting. If you're singing, you can be transmitting. Uh, if you're coughing, you can be transmitting. And we don't know exactly how far that's going to be. Generally six feet, but could be 12 to 20 feet given the right set of circumstances. And that has to do with air handling and so on. We attempted to quote unquote flatten the curve back in March, but we did not do this in a fashion that was concerted enough, coordinated enough. But even that, having said that, I'm not convinced that even if we'd done everything right, that we would have prevented what was going to happen. Again, this, this virus really, really likes human lung tissue. And it's, if it can find its way there, um, you know, and I've had a number of patients that go, well, I, you know, I stayed home all the time. But Again, I've also, you know, seen people at Kroger's, and yeah, I wore my mask. Yeah, yeah, your chin's fine. Uh, so I don't know. I, 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 you know, I have to talk, to talk to my daughter and say, listen, don't be aggressive with these people, okay? I have, a, I have a friend who just, you know, 
her Facebook page. I'm like, hey, listen, hey, pull back, all right? In fact, if you see something like that, six feet, pull back. Don't engage. Um, what's it going to take then to control this? And I will tell you, in my darkest days, several months ago, I thought, you know what? Just let everybody get sick. Just expose everybody. No. No, that was the wrong answer then. It's the wrong answer now. People will die. We won't have resources. Uh, it's, you know, you, one cannot be that cavalier and irresponsible, all right? Well, what about medications? Well, just when I thought we were done with the whole hydroxychloroquine debacle, now I find out that Eastern Virginia Medical College is supporting the use of an antiparasitical ivermectin. Once again, using several small studies, poorly designed, poorly executed, poorly interpreted. We don't want to go there, all right? I can't say steroids work, vitamin D. Remember, we in Huntington are 38 degrees, 25 minutes latitude. That is the same, approximately the same latitude as the demilitarized zone uh, between South and North Korea. We're North. We cannot get enough sunlight to build up our vitamin D. It is not unusual for me to find patients who have a vitamin D level of eight, where it's felt that 31 is the lowest limit of normal. And I like to see my patients at 50 or 60. I admit, I have some that are 120. You've got to pull them back a little. Um, but if you, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day is good, all right? Otherwise, all this discussion of convalescent plasma, monoclonal antibodies, the antiviral remdesivir, and the list goes on and on and on and on. I was halfway, I was talking to our uh, IT people in the back. I was half tempted to put up a slide. I'm like, no, it's not going to help my message at all. By the time we're employing those agents with the exclusion of steroids, I think it's too late. I don't think we're really looking so much at viral replication, more and more virus, which is what all these agents are going to try to control in some form or fashion, but rather the, the immune response. So that leaves us with probably what you're really wanting to hear and learn about, the vaccine. And when I was on WSAZ and, you know, walking down the hallway, people said, are you going to take the vaccine? Well, this was in December, and I said, what vaccine are you talking about? They go, the one, the one. I said, the one what? There are no vaccines today. Well, they're in development. I said, yes, they are in development, but none have been approved, none. And that's when I began to recognize that there was a lot of Misinformation, if I may say. Misinformation number one, uh, that fetal cell lines from aborted babies were used to make uh, these vaccines. And I want to I, I, I say I appreciate those of you who stopped me and said, hey, Dr. Rushton, I need your opinion about this. They're, they're, they're using fetal cell lines. They're using aborted babies. Now, this is... Uh, and by the way, I'll say right now, no, that's not true. Uh, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Novavax, none of them use fetal cell lines, okay, um, in their development. Uh, however, we have a number of vaccines, for example, measles, MMR, where fetal cell lines were used, developed in the 50s. Now, you recall at that point, abortion wasn't legal. And it is... I think very dark that we had these, this research being done, we didn't even know about it, where these tissues were being used. You remember the story of Helen Lackey, she had cervical cancer, and we've been using her cells, her DNA, the HeLa, H-E-L-A cells, for years and years and years. Very interesting, her family finally figured out what was going on, and they said, hey, wait a minute, that's our grandmother, and they're not wrong. So now, if you are a researcher and you want to use a human cell line, specifically the HeLa cell line, you have got to present your research to that committee, that family, and they will decide whether or not you can use their grandmothers, their mothers, their sister, aunt, and so on, cell line. I, I think that's reasonable. 
but they lost a lot of, I mean, a lot of money, the amount of research and grant money and so on that was used there. John Piper actually discusses this. I thought it was a very good discussion. It was floating around on the internet. You know, what should we do as Christians where we, we you know, we're concerned about aborted babies and cell lines? It's a, it's a matter of, of conscience, but I, I have to say uh, that, um, uh, you know, can I in good conscience say to you, don't take an MMR vaccine or don't vaccinate your children against measles, mumps, rubella? Um, I'm not happy that, that uh, well, clearly not happy that aborted babies were used to develop this, uh, but we're talking about something that happened 60 to 70 years ago, and measles terrifies me, and we don't have any other vaccine. So, again, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong there, but, uh, um, you know, be very, very careful about what you decide to do with measles. On the other hand, if we look at the topic at hand, COVID-19, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, okay? We talked about DNA, RNA, protein, and that the RNA that's being made into protein is a messenger or mRNA. And I think this is really uh, quite, uh, quite elegant. Uh, what the researchers have done is they have been able to uh, look at what the virus is making and then say, okay, we just want that snippet, the, the protein that binds our cells, that, or uh, the, 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 ACE, the ACE receptor, uh, that is the S, also known as spike. And if you, look at a, if you look at the coronavirus, it's called coronavirus, it looks like a crown. It's got all these little spikes. And those spikes are really deadly. If that virus does not have the spike, it ain't going to do anything to you. It's useless. It's a, it's a uh, the, you know, you open up the app and the app crashes. You know, you can't find out what movie is, being, is, 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 is going to be played tonight at Pullman Square. It won't, it won't give you that information, okay? Now, Having said that, I've heard all kinds of things. Well, you know, because of the placenta, and there's a, is that me? Is that a plane? Helicopter? Okay, good. I thought I was getting feedback. Uh, if, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the segments within this virus, you're going to find some concordance. It's all RNA. Okay? Uh, but again, the next question has to be, if we are, if we're pregnant, for example, and we're infected with, uh, with COVID-19, which has the spike protein, what is the spike protein doing to the placenta specifically? And the answer is nothing. Now, what, what COVID-19 is doing to a pregnant woman is a much more difficult situation and can be dire. But in terms of what it's doing to our human DNA, and when I say me, I'm talking about a woman, okay, because I'm never going to make a placenta, ever. Uh, and uh, we have to start thinking about, does the RNA of COVID-19 somehow become part of our own DNA? And the answer is kind of, rarely, and to know, as far as we can tell, to know clinical significance. As opposed to HIV AIDS, I have been taking care of HIV AIDS patients since 1987. I have cured exactly, without dispute, zero of them. I've kept a lot of them from dying, but I've cured none of them. And the reason for this is really quite simple. That virus gets into the human cell of the target of choice, and there's several, several targets available, including a cell line in the brain. And it becomes part of the DNA, very stable. And so as long as that DNA is there, that virus can be made. And so basically, clinically, what I'm doing with my patients is controlling the virus that's being made, but not doing anything at all to the cells that have the code for the virus, but that cell isn't actually making the virus. Were that cell to make the virus, I've got medications to control that. As soon as those medications are stopped, 
the virus can be made again. This does not, this does not, this is not, this is not what happened with COVID-19. It's not like that at all. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> people have said, oh, look, I've got antibodies to COVID-19. I'm going to be fine. Yes, well, all of my HIV patients have antibodies to HIV. None of them have been cured. And this is where things get really, really complicated in terms of how our very complex immune system works. We want to make it simple, but thankfully, it's not. It's, it's an absolutely elegant process, and we come in and we take a sledgehammer and then say we understand. We do not understand. All right. So where are we now with these vaccines? Well, we have the mRNA vaccine. It is basically just going to be a shot of a very unstable chemical, this mRNA. In fact, it's so unstable that if it comes up to room temperature, it dissolves. It's no longer coating anything. It's just a bunch of chemicals in soup. All right. And for those who tell me, well, you know, eons ago, there was this soup, and then we got life. I go, yeah, I'm, let's look at this vaccine here. You know, it comes to room temperature, and it's already useless. But, you know, maybe 20 million years? Okay. Uh, so it's got it's, it's to gotta be put in this antifreeze, pegylate, excuse me, polyethylene glycol, also known as Miralax. But we know you can have anaphylaxis to that, and I think some, unfortunately, are having reactions to it. Um, it gets injected after barely being allowed to come to room temperature and then you inject in the body. And our cells pick up this mRNA and heretofore would have recognized it as foreign and destroyed it. So they've had to actually code it and so on so that it actually can become part of a cell's innards. And then the ribosomes say, hey, look, there's mRNA. We've been waiting for some RNA. We're off our lunch break. Let's see what it makes. And lo and behold, it makes the S protein or spike protein. So now those cells for all the world look like COVID-19 infected cells. And our immune system then says, oh, wow, we've got COVID-19. Let's work on that. And we have immunity. Now, I would like to say that's the end of the story, but again, the immune system is not that simple. We're not going to be affecting the placenta. We're not going to be, infect we're not going to be affecting the human genome. We're not getting a chip. We're not getting anything like that. But there are some serious questions that need to be asked and answered, and we don't have those answers. Number one, how long will this last? How long will, uh, will this injection uh, produce an immunity that protects us? It's question number one. We don't know. Question number two, looks like it really does offer some protection, but we know that the older we get, the less response we're going to have. So we do need a number, a good number of people uh, immunized to make a difference. What that number is, I think, is obviously controversial and unknown. And then number three... If we do get the vaccine and we then come in contact with COVID-19 and we actually end up getting infected with COVID-19, what happens next? Three possibilities, I think. Number one, uh, nothing. You're protected. Number two, you get a little bit of infection, but you don't transmit it. But the possibility is there that, yes, you are saved. You're not gonna, you'll be now part of that 80% that really has no difficulty with the virus at all. But you might still be able to spread it. And unfortunately, we do have a very good example of this in the tetanus diphtheria acellular pertussis vaccine, also known as Tdap. If you are a woman pregnant at your second trimester or beyond, they're going to recommend the Tdap. Because, a cellular, uh, because pertussis, whooping cough, can be fatal to infants. But if you are a caretaker of either the mother, the mother-to-be, if you will, or to the child-to-be, 
And I say child to be because it's still inside, okay? Still a child to me, but not outside. Still protected by the mother. They're going to say, we want you all vaccinated, okay? Fair enough. But here's the fun thing, or the funny thing. If you as a woman are pregnant, second trimester you get the, you get the, ad, you get the Tdap shot, right? And then a couple years later you're pregnant again, and they say, oh, you're due for, for Tdap. You go, wait a minute, I just had it two years ago. Tetanus is, actually tetanus vaccines are good for life, but I mean they'll say for tetanus still 10 years, why do I need another one? Because the acellular pertussis component helps prevent severe illness in the recipient, but it does not prevent transmission to those around. So we want the mother to be repeatedly vaccinated every time she's pregnant, but those around her only need it once because they're not otherwise at risk, all right? So that to me is, um, is, is, is one of the biggest questions. And if you're taking the vaccine, you know, we're gonna be looking at you. We're looking to see within your environment, within your area, uh, what's actually going on and whether or not we're seeing not only flattening of the curve, um, but also symptoms and, and so on and so forth. There is one other possibility, which is really, really quite concerning to me. And I will tell you, I have now taken both, I mean, uh, both uh, I've had my, my two shot series. I had the Pfizer vaccine. I don't know if I've been infected with COVID-19 or not. My suspicion is having been on the COVID ward, you know, I mean, all of 2020, is that I, I find it hard to believe that I haven't been. But as far as I can tell, I never had symptoms, at least nothing that I could attribute. I never, I haven't had a fever. Um, you know, on occasion I cough. I haven't had any ultra sense of taste or smell. I've not done a blood test because again, the blood test only would be helpful if it were positive. And even if it's positive, I'm not exactly certain it's positive because of that. I do own cats, for example. But there is a concern that you take the vaccine, your immune system is now aware and trained, and then you become exposed to COVID-19, and maybe it's a slightly different strain or maybe not, and you have an antibody-dependent enhancement, ADE reaction, so that because you, weren't, you were not naturally infected with it, uh, you've actually now primed your system and now you have, again, too robust a response. And right now there are some investigators in the Philippines who were uh, using the experimental dengue virus vaccine and it looks like there may have been some ADE type, type of reaction. So I, I, you know, I think for some people, they may say, you know, I just don't think we have enough information. And I think that's a valid point. I mean, I'm not arguing that the FDA should not have approved the mRNA vaccines. But we still have a lot that we don't know. We don't need to go in conspiracy theory, my personal opinion, just to say, you know what, there may still be some issues. You're going to have to make a decision on your own personal level about what you think is more likely. And I will say this, that for those at risk for complications with COVID-19, to me, the vaccine is a better way to go. I think if there is antidependent, antibody dependent enhancement, um, I think it's going to be relatively uncommon. We certainly haven't seen it. And we have seen these people who've been, uh, who've actually had the vaccine and were obviously exposed to COVID-19 and we haven't seen that. There are two others that are in the pipeline. Uh, AstraZeneca had some, had some study design issues, they made a mistake in the dosaging uh, calculations, but Great Britain has approved it. That actually uses an adenovirus to carry the spike protein uh, into, into the human cell line. And uh, Novavax, I think is absolutely fascinating, instead of using a virus per se, they have baclovirus which has it, but it then infects 
a cell line derived from the fall, uh, the fall army moth. I think that's right, the fall army moth. Uh, <clears throat> and that, so if you end up getting the Novavax, it's not yet approved, but if were you to get the Novavax vaccine, you'll have a, you'll have a uh, moth to thank for, uh, for, that, uh, for that production. Okay, uh, wow, I apologize. I have, I have spoken uh, probably far too long, but uh, I will be happy to, uh, as, as Pastor Robin said, there's the microphone, come up one by one. And, uh, and you know, if, if, you, if, if you're too shy, you know, as we close, then, then you, can, uh, you can pull me aside and we can, we can talk about things. Any questions? Sure, by all means. Be strong and courageous. So I, I don't, again, I don't believe there's going to be any, uh, any fertility issues, all right? Uh, the vaccine, and this may not be directly applicable uh, to, your, to your daughters, but um, I would say this, um, breastfeeding, I see no contraindication to the vaccine at all. Uh, pregnancy, I see no contraindication. Uh, my concern would still be if a woman was actually contemplating pregnancy whether or not she should get the vaccine. And I don't know that we have enough, uh, we don't really have enough data, so I'd be cautious there. But then again, if she were in an environment such as the United States of America, where we have so much COVID-19, uh, and knowing that, uh, you know, the Pfizer's, it, 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 the, the series is completed in three weeks, basically, uh, the Moderna's four weeks, um, I would, my recommendation would be to a woman who says, well, you know, sometime this year I'd like to be pregnant, I say, well, go ahead and get the vaccine now. Abstain, uh, or, or you know, however, however that uh, you know dictates of her conscience. Uh, I think birth control is a is a um, is a spiritual decision, uh, and uh, and, not, and not to be taken lightly. But but abstinence, maybe for a month or so, uh, and then take the vaccine and then go from there. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I just yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I just, like I said, I have, I have absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, that, this, that this virus, whether it be the vaccine portion, which is just one protein, or the entire virus, actually is going to somehow affect the human endoretroviral segment of our DNA, our genome, which obviously encodes for the spumavirus, which actually encodes for the placenta. I, I just don't. I just don't see. Uh, I just don't see any issue there. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Right, so the, the question is, uh, you know, both the Pfizer, Moderna, mRNA virus uh, vaccines, excuse me, are a two-shot regimen, Pfizer three weeks apart, Moderna four weeks apart. What's the likelihood that we're going to see that just be a one-shot uh, regimen? Okay, so <clears throat> point number one, if you are able to get the vaccine and you get the vaccine and then three or four weeks later, you know, you, you, you can't get it. Do you restart the series? The answer is no. Just the, the next available time you can get the vaccine, do that. I am, I am holding the party line that if you began with Pfizer and with Pfizer, you began with Moderna and with Moderna, although I know in Europe they're mixing and matching. I, I don't know how that's going to work out. In terms of why it's two, we have to go back to the phase two trial. So the FDA Operation Warp Speed was actually looking at a phase three uh, tens of thousands of, 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 of uh, guinea pigs, if you will, and you, you, you need two shots to really, to really confer that, that long-term antibody uh, 
development. Now, having said that, uh, do I believe that we may now begin to look at a yearly uh, COVID-19 vaccine? I think that is quite possible, just like we do with influenza. And remember that if you have a two-year-old child uh, who's never been vaccinated against influenza, and we, we start after six months, but let's say a two-year-old has never been vaccinated against influenza, that's a two-shot series, and then yearly. So we're not without precedent in that, in that regard. And it's gonna be really a question of how effective this vaccine is, again, in keeping a person safe and then keeping a person from transmitting if they actually do get infected. And, it, you know, and again, if we look at the influenza virus vaccine, um, you know, I was vaccinated and I got influenza A last uh, February, March in that area. I went and saw a patient that uh, was being moved from a semi-private room to a private room, I spent 30 minutes with him before I found out, because no one told me, that he actually had influenza A. So uh, I, was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in mortal danger, but I was quite ill. I wasn't happy about that at all. And, uh, and I just recognized, yeah, you know, if I hadn't been vaccinated, what kind of shape might I have been in? Because I mean, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be 58 years old, so. Yeah, those are, those are the questions I think we have. One of the quick questions for the second vaccine in response. Uh, they are getting the second vaccine have more of an illness reaction than they did the first time. Percentage of people that are having a more significant illness the second time around, and is that a sign of good reaction or, uh, or not necessary? Excellent question. So the second question is, all right, it's a two-shot series, so the second shot you know, there's more reactions, people are more uncomfortable and fevers and so on and so forth. What does that mean? Okay, simply put, uh, I thought my second shot was, was easier than the first shot. And um, there's no prediction. But if you do have fever and so on, I would consider that to be a good thing, a robust response. I'm getting the, I'm getting the high sign. Okay. Uh, this is sent to me. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you recommend the vaccine for asthma? I do. I do. The only, the question was, do I recommend the vaccine for asthmatics? And, and the, only, the only people I'm not recommending the vaccine to, uh, when, you go for, when, you, when you go for the vaccine, they're going to tell you what's in the vaccine. They're listing everything. Okay? Read that very carefully. Um, uh, they included salt. Sodium chloride. All right. I don't know anybody who's allergic to salt, but let's say you're allergic to salt. All right. You, you take salt, you die. Don't take the vaccine. Okay. It's a little tongue in cheek, but if you have something in that component that you say, oh, wait, I can't take that, then don't take the vaccine. But otherwise, I don't, uh, I don't really, uh, you know, there's the old, you know, influenza, vir uh, influenza vaccine in Guillain Barre and so on. We saw nothing like that with this at all. So. Uh, I have no, I have, my only restriction would be for, for an allergy. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had COVID. I'm sorry, but I'm, you look great. Uh, thank you. But, so the question is, I've been told I'm protected for 90 days, or what do you need to take the vaccine for? You're protected forever because you got the antibodies. Yeah. So what's your That's a great question. Thank you. So we have, we have a COVID-19 survivor. Yay. Yeah. And her question is very simply, I have antibodies, should I take the vaccine? And the answer is yes, you should take the vaccine. Because COVID-19 is not so much controlled by antibodies as it's controlled by what we call cellular immunity. Remember I said that all my HIV patients have antibodies, none of them are cured. Now in terms of antibodies, we're saying it looks as if if you've had COVID-19, you're protected for, nine, uh, excuse me, for 90 days. Right. There's studies coming out now that say eight months. Right. All right. I'm taking all that cautiously because I'm looking at the Spanish data, which showed that in the number of people that had COVID-19 who then had blood tests for antibodies, they had much fewer numbers, indicating perhaps that the antibodies didn't really weren't created or have, um, uh, were, never ma uh, were never made or created or they've waxed and waned. There's certainly a possibility that the assay being used wasn't 
good enough. All right? But my feeling is uh, we are looking for the biggest oomph possible, if I can use that scientifically, and I think the vaccine is our best point of that. Let me also say this, that were you to develop tetanus, you would never develop an antibody. If there's any question about whether somebody has tetanus, I do an antibody test. If the antibody is positive, I know it's not tetanus because they can't have tetanus with an antibody. All right? How do you get antibodies to tetanus? By vaccine. All right? So yes, I'm still, I'm still saying. Now, the other thing I would say is because we've had a limitation in the availability of the vaccine, we've asked those people who've been infected with it to hold off about 90 days to try to make the, 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 uh, the amount of vaccine available. Um, I think, uh, if I understand Pfizer, Moderna, uh, they are actually trying to crank out their vaccine product to have, at least by the middle of this year, thereabouts, 200 million doses altogether. So, um, you know, but if your number comes up and they say, yes, you're eligible, I do it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, we have a question from the live stream currently. Um, somebody wants to know that they have had COVID pneumonia under Dr. Rushton's care with a 16-day hospital stay. When, if ever, can he be vaccinated? <laughs> okay, another good question. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a person with COVID-19 who is, you know, been in the hospital for 16 days, uh, we are, we've actually chosen the number of 20, uh, for those who are the most severely ill, uh, we say that after, uh, after 20 days of symptoms, we don't consider them contagious at all. And I suspect, uh, that we'd probably find antibodies in, in, in most people like that. That's actually forming at about 10 days, seven to 10 days. Um, so I would, I would just say, uh, it, it, it comes down to how, how recovered they are, whether they actually want to head out someplace, stand in line to get, to get the vaccine. Uh, but I know that we are expanding. And uh, if they meet criteria, uh, they could certainly wait a total of 90 days from the first, the first symptoms, and then they could wait. But if they were of the opinion, they were concerned that maybe they wouldn't be able to get the vaccine after that. I mean, they're like, here's my opportunity. I want to seize the opportunity. And as a, uh, you know, one of my fields of interest is actually vaccinology. And what we say is a delayed vaccine is a missed vaccine. So if I got somebody who says, listen, you know what, I want it today. I know I'm within that 90 day period, but I want it today, it's available, I want it. I'll go, go ahead, do it. There won't be any problem doing that. Well, Dr. Rushton, I want to ask you a question. Uh, the MR, the M, RNA, I guess they call it. Yes. The question I had is they've been talking a little bit about, and you may have mentioned this, and forgive me if I've picked that off this. That's fine. If, there's a, if there was a possible mutation with COVID-19 like they've had over in Great Britain, uh, the possibility that they would have to start all over again, or I've also heard that it would be just a matter of changing the code, which would be a minor thing where they could deal with that with the same vaccine, or would they need a new one? Excellent question. So the, you know, we now know that we have a South African variant. The, the, uh, the S protein, the spike protein, is not the same as our most common strain that we have here in America, <clears throat> which actually you could argue is a, you know, this would actually be the third major strain, strain perhaps. Um, the strain that's in America now is not what actually we found in Washington State. It actually promulgated and spread believe it or not, from a biotechnology conference in Boston, Massachusetts about a year ago, maybe 11 months ago. Uh, so now the question is, we have this new variant, the S protein is somewhat different. Uh, it, seems to, uh, it seems to be uh, uh, affecting people uh, with a little, more, uh, uh, a little more strength than we were seeing with this other strain. But again, I would expect that because each time this virus passes through another person, it's gonna weaken a little bit, okay? Uh, and and I, I think at this point, I am not anticipating the need 
to change uh, the Pfizer or the Moderna or even any of these other uh, vaccines uh, because I think there's still be, uh, even with this alteration, there's still going to be a degree of protection. But you know what? Uh, as we see with influenza, where we have minor changes from year to year and major changes, for example, 2009 uh, was a huge change in the H1N1 component. And that was a year where we really had not one, but two influenza vaccine vaccinations. Uh, it's certainly possible, but I don't, I, don't see, I don't see that right now. I would still say, even though it's out there, I would still say go ahead because the likelihood right now that you come in contact with COVID-19, you're gonna come in contact with COVID-19 that this vaccine does have, uh, does have effectiveness again. But again, the caveats are um, how effective will it be for you? And if you do get infected with COVID-19, how sick will you become? and will you actually spread it? So even if you become a little bit sick, but you don't spread it, that is still, that's still a dead end for that virus. And so that's, that's, that would be great news. That's what I actually want to see, that we see fewer and fewer cases because the, the you know, 4,000 deaths a day in America from COVID-19, this is, this is horrible. So anything we can do to lower that would be great. Well, folks, we have exceeded uh, what time we thought we would be doing. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to have a prayer and dismiss. I want to thank Dr. Tom for being here. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I'll also ask him if you have a burning question, he'll remain here a little bit so you can go and ask him personally, uh, just at a distance. Uh, and, uh, but let's pray together and then we'll let you go. And I want to thank those who joined us uh, on the live stream and I appreciate you all being here and uh, following the guidelines. And as, uh, it has served us well as a church. Let's pray. Father, again, I give you thanks. And I pray for an end to this, for a light at the end of the tunnel. Lord, I thank you for the information tonight. And I thank you that we can trust you. And Lord, I thank you for... Dr. Rushton's faith and his commitment to you and to us. Lord, now uh, bless us, keep us safe. We pray for those who are struggling. Lord, we pray for an end. Let us do our part. Thank you again. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, folks. Have a good evening.